This recording was made in 1971 near Los Angeles, California. As we begin the program, Dr. Crane is being introduced to the audience. We are delighted to have Dr. Stuart Crane with us for the Americas in class this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Crane, for those of you who may not know, is the Dean of the School of Business at Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, he has completed his first year there, but uh, while he serves in that capacity, he reserves every weekend to go out and do battle with the God of this world, who is the devil, and uh, resist communism in every way he possibly can. It's my privilege to meet Dr. Crane personally, just briefly at the banquet last summer at the Disneyland Hotel, and then uh, more fully at Bob Jones University this past fall. He was very gracious and flew me down to Atlanta in his airplane so that I could catch a flight back to Los Angeles in time for our Christmas program, I believe, uh, which was taking place at that time. And uh, it's a real joy to have Dr. Crane with us. He brought a tremendous message uh, during the baccalaureate service. And uh, we are uh, very anxious to hear what he has to say. Uh, this hour and then at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Dr. Crane, the Lord bless you. <laughs> right. I'm going to, because this is a class, if you'll permit me to do a little teaching, and uh, I'm going to take a little different approach than uh, often taken. Uh, let me start out by trying to explain uh, what a banking system is. And we'll do this as an economics class if we can, and explain how banks operate. The other day I was talking to a vice president of one of the large banks in California, and he said he asked the president of his bank to explain to him the International Monetary Fund, because he did. The president says, I can't figure it out either. <laughs> now, he said, is it something when the president of a very large bank can't explain the International Monetary Fund? In fact, if it's very difficult to find out what the International Monetary Fund is all about. And if you ever got a textbook on it, it's full of gobbledygook you can't figure out anyway. Uh, the textbooks kind of run over with a bunch of platitudes, but things seem to be quite mysterious about banking and Federal Reserve and what happens to money and depression and inflation and all these other sorts of things. Let me explain it this way, if you will let me. Uh, I am a grain elevator operator. Uh, that is, I have an elevator and people store grain in my elevator. Now, this man comes, he puts 100,000 bushels of wheat in my elevator. What, do I, what does he want from me? He wants me to give him a receipt so he can show that he owns 100,000 bushels of wheat in my elevator, doesn't he? So I issue him a wheat receipt for, say, 100,000 bushels. And this man puts in 20,000, 10,000, 15,000, 18,000. Each pe different people put out grain in my elevator. Some people, they take out the elevator, but they store grain there. Now, what do I find? What happens is that he finds out that he can go out and take his elevator receipt his wheat receipt, and he could buy things with it. He could exchange it for things, or he could sell it on the market. They do that in the grain pit, don't they? In the grain market. They buy and sell what? Wheat? No, they buy and sell receipts for wheat, don't they? Now, that's a grain market. Now, I run my elevator, and I notice something about my elevator. People bring wheat, take out wheat. Sometimes I have a million bushels. Sometimes I have 800,000 bushels. Sometimes I have 600,000 bushels. But I never have less than 300,000 bushels. People are bringing and selling it and coming and going all the time, but there's always 300,000 bushels. That's a minimum ever in my elevator. One day I want to, bills are a little tight, the wife needs a new fur coat or something like this, and I'm going to go down to the bank and borrow and pay interest on it. I say, wait a minute, I don't need to really pay interest. I could do something else. What if I would write up a receipt for 10,000 bushels of wheat and sell the receipt? Now, if the person wanted the wheat, I got 300,000 bushels. They wouldn't know the difference. One wheat looks like any other wheat, doesn't it? So I sell it, and later I'll buy the 10,000 bushels back when I have the money, buy the receipt back for 10,000 bushels, tear it up, and we'll all be even. And I won't have to pay any interest. Isn't that smart? <laughs> sure. So I issue such a receipt. I write one, I go out and sell it. Now, what happens? I never really have to buy that receipt back because I never... Never down to 10,000 bushels. Now, pretty soon, the wife wants to live in a little bigger house. Well, I write another little receipt for another 20,000 bushels a week. And then I write another little receipt for another thing. Pretty soon, the church needs a little money, so I give them 5,000 bushels a week receipt. Go out and sell. And I'm a big shot. The mayor has me on this council and the commissions. I'm on all the boards. 
Everybody knows that I'm a successful businessman. I got the biggest car in town. My children are looked up to. The family's looked up to. We have a respectable, dignified name. Right? I am a successful businessman. And everybody looks to me as one of the finest. I give money to the charity, little kids, candy for the, the school program, and the whole works, right? I am Mr. Nice. But back in my office, when I close the door, I sit there and I worry. Why? Some months, because I've written so many receipts now, I've only got four and five thousand bushels of wheat in the back room. And there's two and three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars with uh, bushels of receipts going around. And if too many people come in and ask for their receipts at once, people will find out I'm a cheat. I'm real worried. Sure, I'm a big shock to the world. You know, we can all kid the world, can yeah. But back in that back room, we sit there and we're biting our nails. What happens if they ask for more wheat than I got? I get real worried. Bright idea. I go down to class and I see old Joe. Joe runs a wheat elevator down there and I say, Say, Joe, you and I are in trouble. What do you mean we're in trouble? I'm a successful businessman. Look, Joe, you're doing the same thing I'm doing. You've written more wheat receipts than there are wheat. I wouldn't do a thing. I look, Joe, don't kid me. I look, we're in trouble. Yeah, we sure are. Now, if people find out I've written wheat receipts without wheat, they're going to suspect you. And if everybody comes in and asks for their wheat, you haven't got, you can't back your wheat receipts any better than I can back mine. If they catch you, they're going to come after me. You know who the dirty people are? The people who would run on us and ask for their wheat. Those are the bad people. Now look what would happen. Look, Joe, if they come and ask for their wheat and we can't give the wheat, all those people who hold those wheat receipts will lose out. Sure, we'll be ruined, but they'll be ruined too, wouldn't they? They bought a wheat receipt and bought it in full faith, and they're going to find out that wheat receipt's no good, and they'll be, it'll be disastrous. Everybody will lose. It'd be terrible for everybody, wouldn't it? Therefore, it is our civic duty to see that they don't find out we wrote phony wheat receipts. You see, as long as they don't know they're phony, they're just as good as real wheat receipts. People buy and sell them and think they're worth value, and as long as they think they're worth value, what difference does it make? Now, that's man rationalizing, isn't it? Huh? Okay. Ah, well, yeah, well, that's all right. Do it. Look, there's only one way out of this. Let's hold a little convention of all the wheat elevator operators in our valley, and we're going to get them all together. So we get them together, and I stand up there and I say, Now, gentlemen, we've all been writing some phony wheat receipts. Oh, no, none of us. Oh, look, 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 look. Let's get out all of the holier now bit and get down to practical problems. <laughs> Now, we've all been writing these wheat receipts. I know there's a lot more wheat receipts wrapping around than there is wheat. And every one of you are in business because you've been doing the same thing I'm doing, because if you weren't doing it, I would have beaten you out long ago. The only way you survive is the same way I survive, writing wheat receipts for the wheat that isn't there. Now, you know how terrible it would be if the people found out we've been writing bad wheat receipts. That would be wipe out thousands of innocent people who hold our wheat receipts right now. We've got to protect those innocent people from finding out we're cheats. Now, let us face facts. We can't buy the wheat receipts back. We can't make it straight. Even if we wanted to, we simply haven't got it. We spent it. See, we can't buy it back. The only practical thing to do is keep them from finding out the wheat receipts are no good. Now, what we're going to have to do is we are going to each put 50,000 bushels of wheat into one central elevator so that if anybody gets too low, he can come and draw the wheat and cover his wheat receipt so nobody finds out that he's cheating. That's called our Community Wheat Insurance Corporation. All right? Now, we're going to have to do another little thing, see? Uh... Some of you people with this nice new insurance corporation, which is guarantee that you are not going to have to be in default, will think that you're so protected you will cheat by writing even more receipts. What we're going to do is make an agreement amongst us that we will work, pull together and elect a trust that is our representatives to a super organization which will control how many phony wheat receipts we write so that we all cheat equally. Otherwise, some of you will cheat more than others. And we're also going to have to stabilize the price of wheat receipts so that those people who cheat less than others, the wheat receipts don't go for different values in the market. 
which would show some of us have. In other words, we're going to... Have, now look, how can we do this? I know some of you guys are going to cheat. Because you're as dirty guys as I am, see? I know just what you're like. Yes, you are. Now, what we're going to do, see Bill over here? Bill is looking for a job. Now, if we elected Bill governor, Bill promises to pass a law saying that we can set up a monopoly control trust to guarantee that we'll regulate wheat receipt writing. And that all wheat receipt writings will have to be official wheat receipts. And wheat receipts will have to be accepted by people as real wheat receipts, whether they are or not. Legal wheat receipts. Legal tender wheat receipts. We are going to force people to have to accept them as real wheat receipts, whether they are or not. They can't question the wheat receipt anymore. And they've got to recognize our monopoly on wheat receipt writing so new phony people can't come in and write wheat receipts and pass them like there are wheat receipts. Not only that, with, uh, he promises to pass a law that anybody who makes a copy of our phony wheat receipts will go to jail as a counterfeiter. <clears throat> He's counterfeiting wheat receipts, isn't he? Only the members of our monopoly association can write phony wheat receipts. This is for the good of the people, because if there are too many phony wheat receipts around, people get suspicious. We've got to keep new wheat receipt writers out of the business. And the second thing is, we've got to make sure that people cannot call for the wheat receipts. So after a few years, this goes along, and people get used to this sort of thing. And of course, remember, who are the bad people in bank runs? Why, the people who come in and ask for their money back. The people who run on a bank are the people who are bad, aren't they? They are causing lack of faith. They are, our textbooks tell us the bad people are the people who ask for their money that they deposited in good faith, aren't they? Because they cause bank crashes and hurt everybody. Why? They're, the bank can't pay. Why? They don't have it. Why? That's interesting, isn't it? Well, let's go back and now take a look at something else. After a few years, people get used to these nice new official-looking wheat receipts. Uh, they can't get wheat for it. We pass a law now. Look, what would happen if people in general ask wheat receipts from everybody? Sure, we can have the central wheat pool. We transfer wheat back and forth to keep any one person getting caught. What if everybody would ask for wheat receipts or a lot of people in many banks at once? We might not be able to deliver enough wheat receipts. What are we going to do? Old Joe is still up there. Uh, we keep, it only costs us half a percent in order, each of us, to finance a good election campaign to make sure the right guy is making the right laws. So we have to make a new law. It is illegal for people to have wheat for their wheat receipts. Now, there are wheat receipts, and there's wheat there, but you can't have any wheat. It's illegal for anybody to hold wheat unless they are a member of the association. Now, members of our association can hold wheat, but nobody else can have it. You understand that? That is to keep these awful people from asking for more wheat than there is. How could they ask for more wheat than there is if we had wheat behind every wheat receipt? Well, they couldn't. But what if there are more wheat receipts than there's wheat? That's the only way you could ever be a run on wheat receipts, right? And so to protect against a run, we've got to make sure that people can't have wheat. But now we've got to be honorable about this thing. We've got to give wheat to other members of the association. You see, you're going to have to pay off to club members in real wheat. But you don't pay off to non-club members. They can't own wheat. Only the licensed members of the association, right? Call the Federal Wheat Reserve Board. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a classic that is. Of course, we do this to stabilize the wheat receipts to protect everybody from unstable wheat market. Isn't that right? Sure. Well, after a few years, people get used to not getting wheat for their wheat receipts. We'll make a new deal. 1968. We won't be required to have any wheat behind our wheat receipts. We'll say that a wheat receipt is the same thing as wheat. And there is no need to have wheat anymore. We can take all the wheat. And what you can get for a wheat receipt, we guarantee to redeem every wheat receipt with another wheat receipt. 
That's like going into a parking lot. You're taking your parking ticket. You know, you put your ticket. They give you a, rece- a ticket for your parked car. And you go in and you say, I want my car. My car is number so-and-so or something. And they say, oh, uh, sorry, we sold your car. But we'd be happy to give you another receipt. Now, you can have a blue parking ticket or a green parking ticket. What color ticket do you want? Oh, I want my car back. Oh, no, we sold your car. Now, look, if you have a Chevrolet car, we'll give you a blue Buick parking ticket. How's that? <laughs> or you go down to the Green Stamp Redemption Center. And they tell you... Uh, for your green stamps, we'll give you some nice new book of green stamps for your old green book of green stamps. You say, well, I would like a prize. Well, sorry, we are giving prizes, but we will redeem your green stamps in green stamps. Isn't that nice? Oh. <clears throat> While we've we got <laughs> this little club going, we have a problem. We've got to make sure that people in other associations and other valleys, in order for our wheat receipts still to appear good. When people in other associations and other valleys... We promise to give them wheat for our wheat receipts that they hold, because they got their club. If they'll give us wheat for their, our, for their wheat receipts that we hold. In other words, amongst other monopoly clubs, we will give wheat and redeem. But we will not do it to people in our own club area who aren't members of the association. Well, there's a problem. People outside of our uh, uh, club area... Some people get those wheat receipts, and they keep demanding wheat. And our wheat gets lower and lower and lower. So we now go to a dual market. Other Monopoly Club members can get wheat, but no one else can get any wheat, whether they're in our club area or anywhere else. There's still a problem left involved. What is that problem? Some of the other Monopoly wheat areas keep giving wheat for their receipts and show up our wheat receipts, which won't exchange the same value. People prefer their wheat receipts over ours. Those are bad people. They're upsetting the inter-community wheat market. There are other people who, valleys, which have their monopoly association, which will not redeem their wheat receipts even for us when we hold them. That is, they have soft wheat receipts. They won't redeem it to the Monopoly Association. How are you going to have to get rid of that? We're going to have to merge all the monopolies into one monopoly and have one worldwide wheat association reserve board called the International Wheat Fund. Right? Then all wheat receipts will be equally phony. (laughs) <laughs> and the market, the wheat market, will be now stabilized, and there can be no run anywhere. The only way to have ultimate assurance and protection is to have a wheat world wheat monopoly control board. Now, I hope you understand what the International Monetary Fund is all about. What it is simply all about is they stole your money. Now, you see, I've got a piece of paper here. It isn't even printed by the United States. It isn't an American note. It isn't a dollar, a United States dollar. It is a Federal Reserve note. Notice, the Federal Reserve is not owned by the United States government. It is a privately owned bank. The private bank prints this money up in Minnesota here last year. A man was arrested for drawing pictures just like these pictures. They brought him into court and called him a counterfeiter. He was found not guilty when he proved that he was willing to redeem his pieces of paper for exactly what the Federal Reserve was willing to redeem their pieces of paper. (laughs) Now, he says, if I gave less than the Federal Reserve, I would be writing a phony claim. See, the Federal Reserve promises to give nothing. Theirs is a claim on nothing, and mine's a claim on nothing. I am doing no different than the Federal Reserve is doing. He was acquitted. (laughs) See, fraud is to write a claim on something that is bogus. He didn't write a claim on anything. He just happened to draw pictures like the Federal Reserve was drawing pictures. They just looked alike. <laughs> How could there be a crime involved? Interesting, huh? Now, let's take a look at another little thing. Ah, uh, illustration two. Uh, there's a thing called a pawn shop. I hope you understand what a pawn shop is. It is a bank. It's a poor man's bank. 
When you go down to buy at that bank, the interest rate is high. Why? The cost of making a loan is the same, the time involved and everything else, regardless whether you loan 100000 or you're loaning 25 bucks. If you're loaning 25 bucks and the guy makes 10 loans a day, he's got to earn enough of the 10 loans to live on, doesn't he? So, relative to the 25 bucks, the cost is high. But actually, the pawn shop earns less per loan than the bank learn, earns, right? So, a lot of people think the pawn shop is bad because their interest rate is high. No, that's just because the loans are small. The smaller the loan, the higher the interest rate's got to be to cover the cost of making a loan. Well, what is a pawn shop? The pawn shop's a poor man's bank. He goes in, he puts up his coat, his collateral, or his watch, right? And he gets 25 bucks he needs. Why does a pawnbroker want his coat or watch? Very simple. If he doesn't want to pay back, the pawnbroker's got to have a way of getting even. How does he get even? He sells the coat or watch, doesn't he? To get the money back, if the guy doesn't come in and pay off the pawn. He doesn't pay what he promised to pay. Now, notice the uh, Savings and Loan Association loans you money on your house. They want a mortgage on your house. If you don't pay the payment, they're going to come and take your house, aren't they? Now, if you go down to borrow on your car to the finance company, they loan you money, make an agreement, right? But they want a chattel mortgage on your car, and you don't pay, they come with a tow rope and haul your car away. If you're a businessman and you want to borrow, you go down to the commercial bank and they loan you, but they want a little lien on your inventory, a little lien on your receivables, they want some little way of getting the money back. Kind of funny, isn't it? Notice, if you're in the business of lending, you've got to have a way of collecting your money back. Don't you? Or you're not in it very long. What would happen if you lent money on cars but said I didn't want any chattel mortgage or anything else and I wouldn't tow your car away if you didn't pay? How long do you think you'd be in the finance business? Well, about five weeks until all your money was gone and then that'd be the end of that. Now notice something else. The finance company does not want to tow your car away. The savings loan company doesn't want to foreclose in your house. They will if they have to. Why? Because if they don't, no one's going to pay. But they don't want to foreclose. They want you to pay. They want you to pay as you promised. They're not in the business of foreclosing. Let's notice something else. The Savings and Loan Association, no other finance company or any of them, ever really wants you to pay back. As soon as you pay back for your car, what do they want to do? They want to lend you on another car. Their job isn't to get their money back, but to keep you in debt to collect the interest. That's what they're in business for. A bank doesn't lend money to a business that they think is going to pay back and not borrow anymore. They lend to a business they know is going to grow and need more and more money and become a better and better customer and borrow more and more money and pay more and more interest. That's what they're in the business for, not getting their money back to keeping it out working, aren't they? Okay? Now, if there is a borrower, there is a lender. And if there is a lender, there is a borrower. If we find anybody borrowing, then somebody is lending. Okay? I mean, it has to be. Simple. That be that. If governments borrow, there must be somebody who lends to governments. Some people would call the people who lend to government international financiers or other sorts of names. International bank, all sorts of names about, uh, for it. But there's somebody who lends to government. These people are leaving for choir practice here. And what do we mean by lending to government? We are told by our schools that we owe the national debt to ourselves. do we? But do we? Does everybody in the United States own $2,000 worth of bond? You'd have to if we owe it to ourselves. Now, if somebody has $4,000 worth of bonds and somebody else has none, then the one who has two, none owes $2,000 to the one who has $4,000. Let's get that clear. Now, some people own way more than $2,000 worth of bonds, and most people own way less than $2,000 worth of government, federal government bonds. I'm talking about federal, not state, local, and everything else. We don't owe it to ourselves. We owe it to somebody else. Let's make that clear. Unless you happen to have a big pile of government bonds. Now, how do we... Let, let's get to something else. If you loan to a government, if you loan to a king, and one of the oldest games of kings is lending or spending more money than they take in in taxes, they first clip the coin of the realm. That's the first game they go into, and after the coins only float and they no longer clink anymore, uh, then they start printing paper money. But that starts inflating. They find that they have to finance their little game by another little thing. It's called debt, borrowing. Now, if they could borrow from their people, they would have already taxed them. If you're going to borrow to finance governments, you've got to borrow from somebody who's got enough money to finance governments. The problem with a person who lends to government is how do you collect? 
How do you foreclose if he doesn't pay? You go into the king and say, King, you didn't pay me. I want my money. I demand my money. The king might say, Off with your head. <laughs> now, that's kind of a dangerous way to lend, isn't it? It's simple economics. So what are you going to do? You've got to have a way of towing away his kingdom if he doesn't pay. <laughs> now, how do you tow away a car, a car? With another car. How do you tow away a kingdom? With another kingdom. Now, that's simple. Uh, we call it, in ordinary, everyday language, war. That's kingdom towing. All right? <clears throat> now, I can't lend to one kingdom without lending to the kingdom's enemy. I've got to make sure the two kingdoms are enemies of each other and about equal size and strength so that my lending makes a difference of who wins in case of conflict. And so the King A knows that King B can whomp him if I'm King B. And King B knows that King A and I can whomp him. So now I have the power over both King A and King B. If I don't have the power over both King A and King B, I'm not in the finance business. Because if I can't tow the car away, I'm out of business. Let's make it clear. Let's take a little history. Back in 1762, a man named Mayor Rothschild started out a little banking house. He had five sons. There was a monopoly set up going on in Europe at that time. Napoleon, a man who mysteriously rose to power, wasn't even a Frenchman, puts on a, mono a continental policy. Nobody could import into Europe anything by law of Napoleon. The English government, the enemy of Napoleon, put a law, a blockade around Napoleon. No one could ship to Napoleon. Obviously, there could be no shipping. But only one family was allowed in broad daylight to run both the French and the British blockade and run the ships from England and anywhere in the world into Holland and deliver goods at fantastically high prices because of the monopoly established by both governments with Nathan Rothschild in England and his brothers on the continent distributing the goods. They became extremely wealthy. In 1815, Nathan Rothschild in England, after the Battle of Waterloo, received the news two hours before anybody else of who won. Well, maybe he even knew before then. But he started selling publicly government bonds. The government would obviously would be financially collapsed if Napoleon won at Waterloo. If Wellington won, the bonds were good. Uh, publicly, Nathan Rothschild started selling government bonds, British government councils, and he started selling them in a panic. To get rid of them, screaming, trying to get rid of them at any price. The prices fell and fell and fell. In two hours, they fell 95%. And he had all of his agents buying the bonds as everybody else rushed to sell theirs. And in 10 minutes, he bought the British government. Not bad for a little operation for an afternoon, you know. In 1820, when the French government was financing itself to a new bond issue, all the French bankers were invited in by the king. And Napoleon, or Louis Rothschild, who built himself a little house exactly like Versailles, was sitting out in the ante room because he wasn't invited. Louis Rothschild was sitting there in his white ermine garments with his big coach and 12 white horses and everything out there and all his liverymen. And he's just sitting out in the ante room. And in a few minutes, people started scurrying in and out of the palace. The, British, the French bond market had just collapsed. And Rothschild is sitting out there twiddling his thumbs as the King of France comes out and bows to Louis Rothschild and invites him in. And Louis Rothschild bought the government of France. Solomon Rothschild is down in Vienna. He is financing his friend and the partner, Prince Metternich, who is running the Holy Roman Empire, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, what is now that whole area. He couldn't even own property in Austria. He just owned the government and the emperor, which was bad for a little boy, just trying to make good. <laughs> what about Kalman Rothschild, the youngest boy? Well, he arrived kind of late, but he arrived down in uh, Naples, opened up the Rothschild Bank in Naples. Within a few years, he had every kingdom in Italy, which, remember, was not a nation yet, so heavily in debt to him, including one little kingdom called the Vatican. In fact, he had the Vatican so in debt to him by 1842, the Kalman Rothschild ordered the Pope to invite him to the Vatican and feed him kosher in public at a public banquet. <laughs> Which was rather humiliating. Particularly when the Pope got up and asked him if he would refer 
to Rome as the holy city. Calvin got up and said, Jerusalem is the holy city, which didn't help the Pope at all. But you know, there are times you can't say anything. It's called diplomacy, isn't it? Do not fast forward. Well, the oldest son sitting up on Frankfurt on the Main. Well, Ishmael found this nice young German count, a baron actually, who was a young ambitious fellow, wanted to go somewhere, seemed to be a fairly bright boy. So he took this little boy in and financed his little career. The man's name was Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, the man who wielded it and built Germany. They did pretty good. Now notice, in Europe, after every war, how there had to be a two powers, groups of powers of equal size, called balance of power. Why? You've got to make sure all King A's can be threatened by King B's and B's by A's. But you need somebody on the outside to change the power. What was that? England. Nathan Rothschild in England, and you had Louis in France, and Solomon in Austria. Notice the center of every militant group, or the, uh, the, the coalitions, was Vienna and, and Paris. With Nathan Rothschild's England staying on the outside as the whip saw which way the thing was to go. You could watch which way the victor was going to be in every war by which way England went. The problem was, when the game came up in 1914, uh, England wasn't enough to throw the battle. So they got a new one called the United States to do England's rule. Well, anyway, notice you've got to have a way of collecting. You also got to have government debt if you're going to get money away. Notice a man belonged to a very wealthy club back in the 1840s. This club made up as the most wealthy and powerful people in Europe called the League of Just Men had two very, of which now are famous people. At that time, they were practically unknown. They were just small uh, members of this. They were uh, really kind of the cloakroom boys named Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. Engels and Marx wrote a book which they were hired to write by the club, the League of Just Men, which later changed its name to the Brotherhood of Congress, to write a book of the necessity, watch the second plank of the platform, of a progressive personal individual income tax and the necessity of a central bank. Why? You need a central bank to be able to collect the money from the government legally. And you need an income tax to collect it legally from the people. Notice the income tax was passed to take it away from the rich and give it to the poor. May I give the Internal Revenue's testimony before the United States Senate in 1969 on the Internal Revenue Act. One day said that in 1968, those people earning more than $20 million in that year paid less than 7% income tax. Those people earning over 600000 have paid no taxes whatsoever. And any 5% of the entire in personal income tax came from the lowest tax bracket. It's not tax rich and give it full. There are 100,000 tax-free foundations that pay no tax. These foundations, let's take the Rockefeller and the, and the Ford and the Carnegie Foundation, with their fabulous millions, support the left-wing schools of the United States. In fact, the schools of education teaching the teachers, the 20 largest schools in the United States in the last 50 years have received over half their entire endowments from two, the Carnegie and the Rockefeller Foundation. Therefore, what these kids are learning today is what they want them to learn. What is that? You need a Federal Reserve to stabilize. We need government control of the money system to stop depression. We have to have the Federal Reserve Bank as next to God, isn't it? And they're taught that in the school. So look at something. You take any econ textbook and what does it do? It spends almost all of its time trying to tell, show you how to prevent the business cycle and the cause of the business cycle. But I will tell you the cause and I can do it by saving you right now 300 pages of reading. The only cause of a business cycle is the change in the availability of credit. And the availability of credit is changed by the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve is owned by the banks, not the government. I will show you something else. I was over the other day, a the chief economist of a large bank in the United States had me over three nights ago over to his home. 
He said, I have a very startling piece of information. I looked at it and I said, I've been saying this all along. It's nice to have your chart to verify. That is that every business cycle is never fought by the Federal Reserve. Notice they always make a mistake. Their timing is off on tight and loose money. But if you will check, their timing is perfect if you want to assume that they create the business cycle. They tighten money and a bust happens. They loosen it and prosperity happens. Now watch something. If I was a governor of the Federal Reserve Board, and I knew we're going in there, we're going to pass some uh, tight money, would I hold my own personal stocks? Or would I sell them, knowing the market's going to go down? If I knew we were going to go pass loose money policy, I know the market's going up, right? Would I be so stupid as not to buy stocks? Now notice, if I have that information, I have to get rich. I don't see the governors getting poor. They get rich. Now, there's some other people who keep getting richer. For an example, here is Rocky, who got me my job on the Board of Governors, and we're having dinner. What I say, and Rocky says, how do you think the market's going to go? What I say, oh, ah, it's all right when I know we just, go, we just passed tight money today. Or what I say, I would think it wouldn't be advisable to hold too much stock right now. I mean, just as a friend, wouldn't you tell a friend what you felt the market was going to do if he asked you? Those people who are friends would get richer. How do you keep this little system where those certain people know? For an example, this man was telling me, this vice president of the bank, that his offices are right below the Lehman Brothers, who are real insiders in, in, in New York. And a week before, he's sitting there talking to Ball, George Ball of the State Department, who's now back with Lehman Brothers. And Ball was saying, uh, well, you're out of stocks, aren't you? And he said, what do you mean I'm out of stocks? And he says, don't you know about Cambodia? This is a week before Cambodia. Sure, they all were out. Why? Certain people get advanced news or give the order. Where did Nixon live the four years before he became president? In Rockefeller's apartment building in New York, a $100,000 apartment covering the whole floor. Where did he work? For a law firm whose major client is Standard Oil. Who do you think he says yes, sir, to? Rockefeller established in 1919 an organization called the Council of Foreign Relations. We have some interesting members of this little club. Not only the Rockefellers, but every president of the Federal Reserve Board in his history. Thomas Dewey, Adlai Stevenson, Dwight David Eisenhower, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, Richard Milhouse Nixon, Hubert Horatio Humphrey. You can have Tweedle Dick or Tweedle Dumphrey. You go down the polls and think you vote and you decide prosperity, depression. You decide these things by a voting once every four years, and that's your civic duty you cut. Look at even when Humphrey wins, Nixon wins. And when Nixon won, John, uh, Kennedy won. If you don't happen to vote the way the newspapers have told you that they control, the school teachers who've been turned out of their factories to support the idea of a controlled economy, I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing in the economy to cause a business cycle outside of a Federal Reserve. Without the Federal Reserve, you couldn't have a depression. In 1928, 1923 to 28, the Federal Reserve was making money plentiful. That increased the amount of loans on stock alone from two billion to ten billion, just under ten billion, and inflated the whole stock market. Then what did they do in the spring of 1929? They started tightening their money. Notice by March, Bernard Brook had sold out. In June, the Rockefellers were out. In July, the Kennedys were out. You go right down the line, and all of them, the Lehmans were out, everybody else is out, and the money is tightening and tightening, and the crash comes. And while the crash was on, remember the Federal Reserve was supposed to make money available to everybody, then why were the banks closing? Why were the little country banks who weren't members of the big club in New York closing? But Chase Manhattan, the largest bank bought by John D. Rockefeller in 1904, didn't close. New York City Bank, the second biggest bank in New York, bought by William Rockefeller in 1904, didn't close. 
Could there be something? Here you see Gus Hall saying we're going to take away Rockefeller's millions and give it to the poor. But Rockefeller doesn't put his money in the Birch Society. In fact, Rockefeller puts his money in the left wing, doesn't he? He puts it in the school, turning out people who hate this country and hate the free enterprise system. Why? He hates the free enterprise system. The enemy of him is a competitor. You notice when one of those poor boys like Teddy Roosevelt got elected to fight the monopoly, did the monopolies become less or more? Did the big businesses become less or more? You see, in the 1900s, small businesses were popping up everywhere, weren't they? Competition against the big businesses were everywhere. Everybody could go into business and everybody wants. In every town, sure, the Standard Oil would come in and dump oil to wipe you out, right? But what happened? The day they raised the price and wiped you out, you went back in business again. It wouldn't work. They had to get Teddy in there to start setting up the legal monopolies, the regulations, the controls on how much oil could be pumped under conservation so that you couldn't get a license to pump oil while Standard Oil could. What do you think conservation programs are for? Only those people with a license can do it. What about crop control, wheat control, cotton control? Why? You don't get a license, your land is worthless, is it? You can't grow cotton unless you get a government certificate. The people in the know get the certificate. The people who finance and give the right money to the right party and the right candidate get the certificate. You play ball, you get the certificate, don't you? If you don't, you don't get a certificate. But how do you keep this, keep this whole game going? You could never get off with it unless you had government schools which were financed, not by the parents, not willingly, but the money was taken by force. And so the teacher does not teach what the parents want, but teaches what the state wants. And if you think the state is independent, it is not. People say, well, what about in England? When the, wealthy, when the, uh, the, the big banks were nationalized, well, you would think that they lost out, wouldn't you? Unless the people of the big banks own the government, then all they really did is merge in their competitors' banks and own the whole shooting range. If you think of the government as an independent agency, then they lost. If the government is a holding company, then they won. You see, there's some different theories. Theory that the Federal Reserve fights depression, or a theory it causes depression. The evidence supports strongly the latter. We have a theory that inflation is supposedly caused by wage price spirals, isn't it? I want to tell you something. I've had 11 years of economics. I'm going to give you a little clue. I'm going to calculate it right in a matter of a minute, because that's about all we have when we've got a couple of minutes. All the workers can strike all they want, and they can't get a wage increase unless the businesses can pay. No matter how brutal a strike is, no company can give in to it unless they can pay the wage increase. The company can't give in unless they can get the increase from the customer. The customer can't pay them unless there's an increase in the money supply so that they can pay the higher price. Second, if there is an increase in the money supply, the customers will bid against each other and force prices up, which will labor will demand a bigger share of and will go on strike. Labor and business don't cause inflation. Increase of the money supply does. See, and neither business nor labor can cause inflation because they can't increase the money supply. Only the government or the central bank can cause inflation. All inflation is caused by the central bank. The blame, however, is never taken by the central bank. Why? They endowed the schools to teach the teachers to teach your kids that it was business and labor. Why? So we're going to need wage and price controls to control the producers of the nation, every bread earner in this country, to fight inflation because they've been writing too many phony wheat receipts. <laughs> it's your fault. You people who want higher wages just because the prices go up. It's your fault. You people who raise your prices because your customers are willing to pay more. You're the dirty people, not the people who have printed more money. We're given a con game. But Satan is the father of lies. Right? And that's the world system. You worship the world system, you're going to get taken. You see, the one thing that a con artist needs is for you not to believe he's a con artist. 
and believe that he's straight up. The one thing the con artist needs is the ability to give you all your information so you don't get it from anywhere else. <laughs> Somebody else might tell you the truth. That's why they tell you, don't listen to these people, don't listen to those, and don't join this, and don't get involved in that, and watch out about these radicals, and these extremists, and these fundamentalists, and all these other things, right? Because they might give you a different point of view, and that would be dangerous. And they spent a lot of time building a lot of schools and doing a lot of conniving to get a system to indoctrinate you on radio, television, newspapers, and ha hammer you in the schools and get the textbooks and everything else, all pointing to one thing. How wonderful the government is, how it's trying to solve all your needs and your problems, how they're managing the money in order to keep you from losing, how they're taking away your money to take care of your old age, only you pay four times for the Social Security, but any private company would sell you the same insurance policy for. Your rates are 400% in the United States government. For Medicare, what you pay for Medicare, which gives you a hospital bed without a doctor at the age of 65, a private insurance company, assuming you start paying the rates at 18, or write you a policy to give you a doctor and a hospital bed and cover you from the age 25 for the rest of your life. How does the government sell that kind of insurance? You gotta buy it, go to jail. What a gimmick. <laughs> How many salesmen would love that pitch? <laughs> Any insurance salesman would sure love to sell that insurance, huh? You can't miss. Just sign up everyone. You notice it's all force and deception. You see, those, you, there are only two concepts of government. By the way, I just give you uh, a, a, a preview. This is, these are little excerpts out of my regular Saturday talk. That's why my wife says, what am I going to say? Well, I just picked something out of my talk. <laughs> So we go at, at, at talking about this at length in a whole series of things, of political concepts and social concepts and educational concepts and what the whole program of the civil rights are about and what the whole program of the peace things are and what the ca campuses are doing and what the program is to do with the mind. Why? The people who have been writing the wheat receipts don't want you to call them. Let me finish up with just one other little example that comes to my mind. Maybe I can jam it in here just to kind of a short one. How does federal debt come about? Let's see if I can do it in your mind. It's a little difficult. I don't have a blackboard here. The government takes a piece of paper and writes a bond. I owe you $100,000. That's called a bond. It's an IOU. They sell it to the Federal Reserve. Wait a minute, do they sell it to the Federal Reserve? No, they give it to the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve opens up a bank account and allows the government to write checks on an account that isn't there. And what does the Federal Reserve use to back up this new bank account that they just invented? Oh, the bond that was just invented is the asset to cover the liability of the new bank account they just invented. <laughs> so the security against the bank account is the bond that they just wrote, okay? Now, the government writes checks and gives it to people, don't they? Those people think that they're money. They go down, put it in a bank account, and they start buying things. Notice this money came out of nowhere, didn't it? Now there's more money, but no more goods. The government didn't produce any. So the extra money chases the existing goods. What happens? The price of all existing goods must go up enough to absorb all the new money. That's called inflation. If the government sells the bonds to the bank, the inflation is equal to the amount of borrowing. If the government sells it to the Federal Reserve, it's equal to the amount of borrowing times the reserve requirement. If it's 20% reserve requirement, five times. I won't explain that to you. It's too complicated, but it's, there's a multiplier. If the government sells a bond to a private citizen, there's no inflation. But private citizens don't buy all the debt. In fact, they only buy about 25% of the debt. The other 75%, but how do you get in debt? How do you keep the, getting this debt to go up so you can write the bonds? Notice. The Federal Reserve, which is a privately owned bank, and the banks that buy these bonds, so they put up nothing for it because they just opened a bank account and backed it with the bonds, do collect interest payments taken from you in the form of income taxes every single year or nothing. They put nothing up for it. They receive 20,000 millions a year of your money taken now legally. But how can they take it legally? You gotta get the nation in debt. How do you get in debt? Poverty programs and war. Okay. You want to know why we're fighting in Vietnam? Not to fight communism, to raise the debt. 
You will never, we've never uh, uh, taken care of any poverty. Poverty has never decreased with any poverty program, but death has increased. All of our ADCs has never caused less illegitimate children. It's called more. It's caused more. All of our money being poured into schools have not pr produced more productive people, but less productive people. Not more patriotic people, less patriotic people. Not more moral, moral people, but less moral people. That wasn't what it was for. What it was for is death. Now, in order to have an excuse to fight all these wars, they need communists. Lenin was financed by Jacob Schiff, Warburg, the Federal Reserve Bank, member of the CFR. Khrushchev, a few years ago, David, uh, David Rockefeller, Ch chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and of the Standard Oil Company, the number one hate man of the communists in the world takes his vacation in the Kremlin. Isn't that interesting? When his vacation is over, Khrushchev is no longer premier. Now, I can't prove any connection between the two, but I'm suspicious that the boss came over and fired the branch manager. <laughs> Khrushchev didn't fire Rocky. A couple years ago, Nelson Rock, last year, before the Senate, he said, I believe that the wealthy of this nation owe it to our country to contribute 5 or 10 percent of their income in income taxes, even though they don't legally have to pay. Five or ten percent. They take more than that for me, that dirty, rotten crook. And look at Ted Bobby Kennedy in 1966 says, Nelson Rockefeller's a dirty rat. He only paid $685 in income taxes last year. What a rat, because Bobby Kennedy paid none. All of his was in a foundation. In fact, no Kennedy has ever paid any income tax. No, Kennedy, they've only paid the whole family property tax once in their life, and that was on the Chicago, Mar uh, the, the Merchandise Mart, after John Kennedy was president, they paid at half rates. They wouldn't even go full rate on one building to try to look legit. The Rothschilds, who by 1850 were considered wealthier than all the royal families of the world, have never paid a tax of any sort to any government in history. Take it from the rich and give it to the poor. Isn't that what this game is? Uh -huh. Huh? <laughs> We've been kind. Well, it happened before. It happened again. Thank you very much.